What's good, fam? Teacher Eddie back with a reaction to George Washington's private life. So a lot of people have uh, been asking me to do reactions to uh, presidential history. So I figured, why not start with the first, right? The father of our country, George Washington. We all know about George Washington being the father of our country, the general of the army during the revolution, but what was his private life really like? So Weird History has a video called What Was George Washington's Private Life Like? Let's take a listen, and as always, I'll be adding in whatever tidbits I feel are necessary. Okay, we cannot tell a lie, so let's tell you about George Washington. We're used to picturing George Washington as an older gentleman with white hair and false teeth, but he was once a young man, and like a lot of young men, he had an eye for the ladies. At 27, George became engaged to a young widow named Martha Dandgride Custis, who would become his famous wife, Martha Washington. However, while he was planning his wedding to this wealthy landowner's daughter, he was also writing romantic letters to a married woman named Sally Fairfax. Oh, George, you That's sly true. fox. Oh, In one of the letters, yeah. dated September 12, 1758, Washington told Sally that he remained devoted to a lady. In the parlance of the times, this was a way of implying his forbidden love for her. Because circumstances kept them apart, the lovelorn and surprisingly poetic Washington went on to say of Fairfax, I feel the force of her amiable beauties and the recollection of a thousand tender passages that I could wish Ooh. to obliterate. The letter Ooh, also acknowledged George. Martha in slightly less poetic terms, calling her an animating prospect. The truth was, however, an Washington animating had prospect. Martha for reasons having to do with social convention and economic prospects rather than love. Fairfax, for her part, kept George's letter until the end of her life. Uh, yeah, so this is absolutely true. So... A uh, couple of points here. Number one, the the reason he married uh, Martha was absolutely 100% a business transaction, really. He, he loved Sally Fairfax, and no matter what circumstances that they had met under, that would have never worked out uh, because Sally's family wanted her to marry someone in her station that was worthy of her, and Washington was not that which is the reason why he married Martha. Martha was in the same situation, except for the fact that Martha was a widow. And a widow was not as much in demand uh, at, in those times. So Washington turned out to be somebody who was ready, willing, and able. Uh, they were in their mid-20s. Uh, she was a widow. She already had four children. So slim pickings, right? As far as Fairfax goes, uh, her and Washington kept uh, in touch. Uh, they were actually very close neighbors as well. Uh, Washington was very good friends with the Fairfax family. And uh, during the Revolutionary War, though, she and her husband moved to England. And eventually their entire fortune was lost uh, due to bad investments, but mainly because they remained loyal to the British crown. So a lot of their wealth was confiscated. And unfortunately, Sally met a very sad ending. Uh, her husband eventually dies and she dies all alone uh, in the early 1800s, about a decade after Washington dies. And she dies a very lonely, miserable existence. And it was unfortunate, uh, but yeah, Washington was in love with Sally Fairfax and Washington was a ladies man. He was very desirable. He was very tall, number one. Uh, he was a very good dancer, apparently, as well. And he was, again, he was a catch, man. And a lot of women really loved Washington. Uh, as far as his marriage with Martha, though, a definitely more business arrangement than love affair. When George and Martha were married in 1759, Martha brought her two surviving children, Jackie and Patsy, to the Union. Washington chose to raise the children as his own. Yes, she had two, okay, she, she had four children, but by the time she married Washington, only two had survived, and unfortunately, these two were not long for the world either. Uh, her son uh, died in his 20s, uh, the daughter died earlier than that, um, so very tragic, and of course, famously, uh, Martha and George never had children of their own, even though Washington really wanted uh, children of his own, never happened and by all accounts was a doting loving parent it's even known that he ordered special toys from london for the two kids tragically the children both died at relatively young ages patsy passed away at 17 from complications arising from epilepsy while jackie died of a sudden illness shortly before his 27th birthday 
Yeah. George and Martha never had any children of their own. That's George the big Washington one. was 11 years old when he inherited his first slaves. And by the end of his life, records reflect he had enslaved 317 people. During the 56 years he ran his plantation, many attempted to escape. This even happened during the American Revolution, when, ironically, 17 of George Washington's slaves fled to a British warship to gain their freedom, which was not on the agenda in America at that time. Contrary to the image of all being happy and contented, many of the slaves who were closest to Washington and his family, including George's personal assistant, Martha's personal maid, and the family cook, all either escaped or attempted to escape from Mount Vernon. However, it's true that in his will, Washington instructed that all the slaves he owned outright under the law should be freed, which actually only included 123 of the 317 slaves the family managed. And Washington stipulated that they only should be freed after Martha died. Exactly. Yeah, that was, that was the whole point. So yeah, there is a depiction that, oh, well, but Washington was so good to his slaves. Well, I mean, that's your definition of good. It still amazes me the amount of people, whenever I mention slavery and the Founding Fathers, how many people defend slavery by saying, well, look, I'm not trying to defend slavery, but, uh, you know, that's like saying, I'm not racist or anything, but you're about to say something racist. So it's true. Yeah, there's a, well, Washington freed all his slaves in his will upon his death. Not really, because number one, he didn't free all the slaves. And number two, they weren't to be freed until after Martha died. Even though Martha died, uh, I think three or four years after George died. Uh, George died in 1799. I think she died either in 1802 or 1803. But yeah. America's this is not a long way from perfect, and it is yeah. known that several of them had multiple children this is not who were enslaved on their plantations. In Washington's case, however, the historical record is not very clear. Debate continues to this very day over whether the father of the United States also fathered a child with a woman named Venus. The child in question was named West Ford, which sounds like a great name for a movie cowboy. Ford was born in the 1780s, and according to one of his descendants, his mother Venus was known to be Washington's personal sleep partner. Who's that in bed with you? Nothing to see here, it's just my personal sleep partner. Family lore holds that when it was obvious she had become pregnant, Washington no longer slept with her. It's also said that several people commented on And again, whenever they say family lore, they're talking about West Ford's family. How much Ford looked like Washington, and Venus identified Washington as his father. Other historians, though, doubt that lore. They pointed to evidence that Venus couldn't have arrived at Mount Vernon until the year after West Ford was born. Moreover, it's known from his letters that Washington wanted children. His failure to produce an heir with Martha, who had four children of her own, suggests he may have been sterile. Such a condition could easily have been a result of one of his earlier bouts with smallpox or tuberculosis. DNA testing, unfortunately, seems unlikely to settle this one. We don't have enough of Washington's DNA to test, but even if there was, it wouldn't really matter. West Ford's body, which was buried in an unmarked grave with 50 other people, has been effectively lost. Yeah, so so on the uh, the whole Venus and West Ford thing, so I actually attended a conference uh, many, many years ago on this, and overwhelmingly, there there are some historians who, of course, believe this, but overwhelmingly, most don't for a number of reasons. Reason number one being that Washington was very, very conscientious when it came to his private life and his personal life, because he knew how important he was to this country. He knew that everything that he did would be scrutinized. And also he learned a huge lesson from Alexander Hamilton's sexual uh, fiasco. And so, Number uh, number two is, yes, Venus was a slave on a Washington plantation, but during the time when she got pregnant, she was a slave on George Washington's brother's plantation, not George Washington's. So a lot of people and a lot of historians say that, look, even if DNA testing proves that there's Washington DNA, doesn't prove it was George's because it could have been his brother that knocked her up, right? Uh, and third, and probably most important, is Washington really wanted kids. And if he could have gotten, um, you know, Venus pregnant, he could have gotten Martha pregnant, and Martha had already ge gave, given birth to four children, so it's highly unlikely right for this and many many other reasons that look is it possible of course it's possible uh for years until the dna testing between thomas jefferson and sally hemmings a lot of historians wrote that off as rumor as well but the big difference there was that sally hemmings and thomas jefferson's relationship was not a secret everybody knew about it john adams used it against jefferson when he ran against him for president um when he when he was going for a second term which thomas jefferson won 
So it wasn't a secret. Uh, she was his companion. She accompanied him when he went to Paris. Uh, whereas there's no evidence of that type of relationship between Washington and Venus. Not being huge fans of George Washington, several British officials tried their hardest to destroy his reputation by starting scandalous rumors about his character and faithfulness to his wife. In this is another reason. The Boston newspaper reported that Britain's Royal Navy had intercepted a letter about General Washington's private life. Supposedly, it claimed that a Virginia congressman had procured one Kate, the washerwoman's daughter, over the way for the Which was a fake with. letter. The letter is believed to have been forged in an attempt to smear Washington. Another British group tried something similar in 1777. This time, they created fake trial transcripts that recorded a soldier testifying that Washington kept a girl from New Jersey of whom he was very fond as his mistress and hid the affair from his wife. Man, if you're gonna keep a, if you're gonna keep anyone as a mistress, mistress, trust me, it ain't gonna be a girl from New Jersey, okay? I don't care if it's if it's 2021 or it's 1777, man. Nobody's keeping a mistress from New Jersey private, man. Trust me. Um, but this is another reason uh, because a lot of the accusations against Washington having extramarital affairs were really propaganda that was you know trumped up by the British to discredit Washington because really that was the most powerful. A uh, weapon that Washington had was his reputation, right? So if you could tarnish his reputation, that would be a huge victory for the British. The woman's name was said to be Mary Gibbons, and the witness also testified that Washington. Man, they know Mary Gibbons is in night, New Jersey. Spy. Stop it. A second witness alleged Gibbons was a spy who was sleeping with Washington in order to copy top secret documents from him while he slept. That's a fast copier. However, records suggest that both the witnesses and the mistress were completely fabricated. Also, yeah. George was with Martha in New York at the time the alleged liaisons were supposed to be happening, and he never left her in the night for any secret business. After her husband yeah. had spent eight years away from her during the Revolutionary War, Martha Washington was less than happy to learn that he was then going to serve as president. Martha was the kind of woman who was not shy about expressing her displeasure, and in a letter to her brother she wrote that she was truly sorry to tell him of George's victory in the election. She also added that she felt it was much too late for him to go into public life again. Feeling as she did, Martha didn't willingly accept her role as first lady. The formal dress, weekly receptions, and constant socializing were all difficult adjustments for her. She even complained to her niece that she felt more like a state prisoner than anything else. Yeah, again, so it wasn't like, you know, the Revolutionary War ends and then Washington becomes president right away. So after the Revolutionary War ends, Washington is done. He is retired as far as he's concerned. He's paid all of his dues. He helped win the war. His job was done as far as he's concerned. So in 1783, he retires to Mount Vernon and he concentrates on the family business. So George Washington, unlike his contemporaries like Jefferson and Adams, he really never had a formal education to speak of. So George Washington is a teenager and in his 20s, uh, his dream job was to be a surveyor, and that's what he did, and that's kind of how he got involved with the French-Indian War, which then catapulted him into the military life, which then eventually is why he was chosen as General of the Continental Army. So as a surveyor, uh, he was really, really good at, uh, again, surveying property, land, but he was also a very savvy businessman. So when he and, uh, and Martha get married, he inherits, obviously, uh, Martha inherits uh, about 2,000 acres worth of land. By the time Washington dies, he'd quadrupled it to about 8,000 acres. Uh, he was constantly experimenting with different crops and planting and all that stuff. And eventually, the big money makers for him was when he switched over to wheat farming and then also uh, from the wheat farming came his distillery. Uh, so George Washington produced a lot of whiskey. And also he grew hemp. But then there's that huge uh, misunderstanding that, oh, uh, the founding fathers grew hemp. So obviously they smoked a lot of weed. The type of hemp that they grew was good for making rope. But it was nothing that you could get high off of because it didn't have enough THC in it. But Washington was one of the wealthiest, possibly the wealthiest of the founding fathers, but he worked hard for it. And so when he was elected president, it was not something he wanted. He seeked out becoming general of the Continental Army, but he did not seek out the presidency, nor did he want it. But he couldn't sit back 
during the uh, during the Constitutional Convention because he saw that they were just not coming to any agreements. You had the Federalists, the Anti-Federalists. Nobody could agree on a goddamn thing. So Washington agreed to come and basically be kind of like the judge, right? To be kind of like the impartial uh, negotiator, so to speak. So he didn't say much, but his presence there spoke more than any words he could say and that really then cemented everybody voted for him he's still the only unanimously elected president in the history of this country he received every single vote so call to he served right but he really didn't want it and martha definitely didn't want it Martha Washington contributed a literal fortune to her marriage, catapulting George Washington right to the top of Virginian high society. Not only was Martha acutely aware of how much she helped her husband get ahead, she apparently... Oh, she kept that shit over his head, yeah. Fact either. According to reports, Martha did not fit our stereotyped image of the deferential 18th century wife. Rather, she was strong-willed and insisted upon being heard. And when we say insisted, we mean it. Martha was a foot shorter than George, so when she wanted his attention, she would simply yank on his collar, forcing him to look her in the eye. Whether she needed this unusually insistent and perhaps aggressive tactic is unclear. But records do indicate that George respected his wife's opinions, or yes. pretended to, to save his colors. Here we Washington go. Washington yeah. was merely the winning general in the Revolutionary War and the first president of the United States. He was also a booze maker. Yes, Washington owned a distillery that eventually became one of the largest producers of whiskey in the country. His brand was so yes. popular that he could pay his family doctor and farm employees with bottles of the hooch. By the time Washington died in 1799, Mount Vernon's distillery had... Which was really not uncommon at the time. Bartering was still a thing. Produced somewhere in the neighborhood of 11,000 gallons of whiskey from rye and corn grown on their own fields. Whiskey wasn't the only thing Washington was making on his plantation estate. He also grew hemp on his land. The crop, which he grew for decades, would be made into ropes, cloth, and nets. And we know what you're thinking. For those wondering if General George liked to light up at 420, or have seen Slater's speech about George and Dazed and Confused, the answer is almost certainly no. Unlike modern recreational cannabis that contains 6 to 20% THC, the stuff Washington grew contained less than 0.03%. Exactly. Even if he did light up a fatty, it was no bueno. No bueno? Okay. While living in Philadelphia during the 1770s, Washington is said to have visited a local seamstress named, wait for it, Betsy Ross. He just needed her to embroider ruffles on his shirts, but she must have done a hell of a job, because according to legend, he returned in June of 1776 looking for something slightly more important, a flag for a new country. The legend holds that Washington showed Ross a drawing of a flag with six-pointed stars. Ross, it said, took one look and suggested five-pointed stars, because they were easier to make. It's a fun story, but historians doubt it, since it was first circulated by one of Ross's own descendants a hundred years after it supposedly happened. Yeah. I actually covered that in a different video. I think it was uh, historical misconceptions or lies you learned in history class or something like that. So, yeah, Betsy Ross did not design the flag, but that was never the claim. Uh, Betsy Ross sewed the flag, but she didn't design it. Father of your country is a pretty impressive sounding title, but nearly as impressive is Washington's other title, Father of the American Mule. Yes, after receiving a prized Spanish donkey from the King of Spain, Washington became the first person in America to breed mules. It was 1785 I when did the not know that. arrived at Mount Vernon, named Royal Gift, who the general described as too full of royalty to have anything to do with a plebeian race. But apparently hard up for a good book to read, Washington kept at it, and by 1799, he had 63 mules at Mount Vernon. Why was Washington so determined to build his mule supply? Was he just trying to avoid Martha? No, he was doing it for America, of course. He believed mules, which required less feed than horses, would revolutionize farming and save farmers money. Turns out, he was right. Although it's yeah. also possible he was avoiding Martha. So what that's true. Uh, so good video. Yeah, gave us some insight into George. Uh, very interesting. I did not know the mule thing, but definitely, like I said, Washington was a very hard worker, very innovative. So and again, like I said, he was always thinking about his country. His country was the most important thing to him, more important than Martha, definitely. But very good video. Um, some other points that are interesting about Washington is, uh, again, unlike his contemporaries, he didn't have like a formal education, really. But he did write one book. And really, the book was him copying uh, rules on etiquette that uh, he, he'd kind of gathered up over the years. Washington was very, very anal when it came to rules and when it came to behavior and appearances uh so it's really funny if you if you can find it it's online uh just uh george wash just google george washington book uh on rules and you'll find it some of the rules there are just absolutely ridiculous uh as i mentioned washington was also a really good dancer i mean really good 
He was famous for his dance moves. He had all the moves. Ladies, man, the ladies loved him. The men loved him. Uh, Washington was beloved. Uh, not to say he didn't have points where he, you know, he struggled, but overwhelmingly Washington was one of the most beloved, if not the most beloved of the founders. And again, very interesting character. Uh, if you're interested in, uh, books on Washington, of course, there are many great books. Uh, my recommendation would be his excellency, George Washington, uh, one of the better biographies on Washington, but either case I've been teacher ready. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comment section, what you think, let me know any other types of videos like this that you'd like me to react to, and I'll catch you next time. And as always, shouting out Teacher Eddie's Patreons who keep things running here. Starting with the top Chancellor's tier, Elena G, Alex, Cuckles, Kiara, John Alonzo, Naval Colt, and the Hollow King. The Principal's tier, Addison Lynn, Blue Tech, Chad A, Chris H, Chrissy, Clement, Freeman, Laura, Lord Gandalf, Moody Kakati, Nathan M, Quiet J, Rachel H, Rob N, Robin B, and Vijandra. I've been Teacher Eddie, and I'll catch you next time. Fan.